to Transformative Principal, where we interview real principals who are doing amazing things to help our students every single day. I'm your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter, at Jethro Jones. Today, I am very fortunate to have Tony Sananis finish his interview. If you are listening to this in the car, you might want to pull over and take out a notebook because Tony has so much great information to share with you today. He is an inspiring principal who you can tell loves what he does and loves the students that he's working with. This is a great interview and I hope that you learn a lot from it. And I hope that you'll excuse that I was recording in a place where there was a training going on. They came in halfway through the interview and so when I talk, there's a lot of background noise. I did my best to erase that so it's not as annoying. So anyway, the good thing is what Tony says so you can ignore most of what I say. And I'd like to thank our sponsor for this week's episode, SaneBox. This last week was spring break, and so I didn't get a lot of emails, but it was really nice at the end of each day to get an email from SaneBox telling me about all the marketing emails that I'd missed and be able to deal with those and not have them interrupt me while I was on spring break. So please click the link in the show notes and give SaneBox a try. I think you'll really love it. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about what you're really good at and known for, and that's being a good branding expert for your school. Talk about sure. how somebody would, who is just getting um, into social media and how they could take their school from nothing to being a positive brand that people think positively about. Sure. Um, I think I think the whole branding things, uh, just so you know, I'm going to... Uh, Food is being delivered as I'm doing this, and I have to eat. <laughs> but I, I, I got I, people I, behind I, me, no worries. Good. So the whole branding thing for me started um, after I took a workshop with Eric Scheninger. Um, last year at a no, two years ago at ASCD, and then again last summer at NESP, which is the Elementary School Principal Association. And Eric said something really simple that resonated with me. Why are we going to let other people tell our stories when we can be the one telling our stories? We can create the perception. We can build the reality. Um, and, and it just it stuck with me. And I was like, yes, we can. You're right. We control that. And why am I going to let the local paper write something or the local news you know, agency run a story about the Common Core or high-stakes testing or, or how much teachers get paid and we get paid too much and blah, blah, blah. Um, when, in fact, we can spotlight not only what we're doing, right? Because I can tell you all the wonderful things we're doing at Candy Act, but when we tell a story, I can tell you how we do them. So I can tell you we do writers' workshop, but how does that look, right? And why does it look that way? Because writers' workshop is rooted in a philosophy of of teaching and learning. It's rooted in the gradual release of responsibility of learning from teacher to student, and so it's about philosophy. It's not about program or resources. And I wanted our community to know that. I wanted our community to know that that. That's what we build our thinking on, not just randomly saying, okay, let's buy this resource and put it in place, but instead, this is why we believe in that. This is how we do it. You know, um, We believe in one-on-one -on -one instruction here at Candy Attic. Like We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction. There's a lot of you know, uh, reading conferences, writing conferences, math conferences, whatever, because every kid is different. They learn different, and we believe in formative assessment. What does that look like? Here are pictures to show you. You know, um, we believe in small group work because research shows that proximity plays a role in, in teacher transmission of learning to student or student availing themselves to learning. We believe in valuing the whole child. Like, I love my kids, and they know that. And so when kids feel good about themselves in a space, their brain releases endorphins. And when your brain releases endorphins, you are open to learning. You know, so... So that's a background in terms of like that's the stuff that we do here. So why are we going to let Newsday write an article about the fact that we get paid too much or that we only work eight months out of the year or some you know, business like that? No, because we do a lot. A lot goes into everything that we do. Every choice we make is thoughtful, is reflective, is meaningful. It's not just random. We just randomly decide to do one-on-one -on -one instruction. There's research that speaks to the power of that. So after hearing Eric and talking about it in our school, I started using Twitter. Our, I'm very fortunate. Our building is um, is Wi-Fi, um, and I walk around with an iPad and I take pictures all day and I tweet them out with captions. I'm conscious I don't put anyone's name in a tweet. I just write, you know, grade two kid working on making an inference or whatever. So um, 
that's how I started telling our story. I did Twitter 101 workshops for parents so that they can get connected. We have over 100 parents who are on Twitter. Um, we have 400 kids, so it's not bad. Um, but I also realized that not everyone's on Twitter. So we use Storify, which is a web-based and app-based uh, resource where you can curate all your tweets and collect them. And so I send those out in a link to our parents on Friday. Here's our weekend tweets. They still get the picture and they get the caption. I'm really thoughtful about the caption because I want that to capture the how and why, not just the what, not just like here we are in a small group. We're in a small group because, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, that is how I've gone about branding our school. So hashtag candy egg goes in every tweet and um, does it. <laughs> and um, you can find that when you Google candy egg. So it was an opportunity for us to take control of our storytelling. And I know people think branding like negatively because you're trying to market or whatever, but you know what? We are businesses. That's what we are. Um, we are about money on some level. We are obviously primarily about kids, but money's involved. So we, um, we need to capitalize on that. We need to tell the story. So that has been the main platform for me, social media. The other thing that I started doing this year, which I love, is we do video updates of, with our kids. Um, and so each week, a different class is spotlighted, and they have a couple of days to go around the building and find out what each grade level is doing and what special areas are doing. They come and they have lunch with me on Wednesday or Thursday, depending on the week, and we film a little video. It takes like 20 minutes or so, but it is such an awesome experience for these kids to know what's going on in their building, and then we shoot this video out. So I'm not the one telling the story because you know what? I could be making it up for my office, right, because the principal just sits in their office all day. Well, my kids are the ones. They're living it. They're telling us. Um, so next week we will start, we have gone through fifth grade, fourth, third, and second. So we're going to start first grade. So we're going to have little first graders finding out what they're doing in fifth grade, and they're going to come and tell us about it. Um, so I'm really excited, and the feedback has been really positive. Uh, those go on YouTube. I use the TouchCast app for that, and they then go on YouTube, and um, we get over 300 views a week, which I think is pretty awesome. You know, um, George Kuros, who I love and I respect, he has picked up my video um, updates and he spotlights them during um, his presentations. And Dean Shiresky, or Shire, I don't remember how to say his name. Shiresky. You know, Shiresky, okay. He also spotlights those, which is great. I think it's like it's such a powerful tool and it takes so little time, but it's student voice. So the, the brand management has been shifted from me to our staff and our kids because the one thing I need people to know if they're listening to this, you have to make sure the brand experience matches the brand promise. So I can't sit and tell you that we believe in one-on-one -on -one instruction, we believe in small group instruction, and then it never happens. Um, it's got to happen. And so, and that starts inside. That starts as a, as a school community. That starts as a district community. Like, what are you doing? What do we believe in? What, how are we going to teach us? How are we going to plan? You know, we believe in, uh, you know, understanding by design. So we believe in essential questions. That's going to be a part of our thinking when we plan. And so that brand promise must match the brand, brand experience or don't put it out there. Don't falsify what's going on. So that's that's my thinking. Yeah, I think that's great. Don't tell people that this is how we do things at our school and it's not really how we do this is what we believe, but it's not really what we do. It does right. have to be aligned and I think that's a that's a great point. So you taught Twitter one on one classes to parents. Um and staff. And staff. And then um mm -hmm. you do uh these weekly videos um and then you post those out. How have you dealt with the student privacy and um, parents not wanting their kids on the internet? How have you dealt with that? Is that through education? Great That's a great question. I got lucky because <laughs> I work in a district that forces, um, not forces, but families have to opt out. So when they register their kid, they have to check off the thing that says, I don't want them in pictures. Same so with we our don't, district, yeah. Yeah, and which is which really is genius because if you try to get everyone to opt in, you're going to be chasing people around for you know, a year. So, um, so we do the opt-out thing, and I have been so transparent in it. I talk to the parents about it all the time, and I and they know, and I and I can tell you that it has changed the relationship between our our school and our community. It's it's transparent. They know what's going on. Um, they feel comfortable coming to me and asking me questions. When we have PTA meetings, we're not just talking about bake sales and 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 fundraisers. We are talking about book clubs and what those look like and why we believe in those. We're talking about guided reading and why that is. We talk about math and focus because that's a new math resource we're using. How is that preparing our kids for middle school and, and so on and so forth. So the conversations are so, so much richer um, and parents feel that they can access me. I have parents who tweet me about math homework. They're like, need help with this math problem. What do we do? You know, um, And it, it's, 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 it's transformed. So you talk about transformational leadership. That has transformed 
the way we, we function as a community because no school can be successful without the community support and no community can grow without a school that's you know constantly reflecting and thinking and evolving. So, so that's really been a, a focal point for me. That's awesome. Um, it sounds like there's some amazing things that are happening there. Is there, is there anything else that, uh, that you want to say about that branding, something else that somebody could be doing that they may not be? I think it's just a matter of starting small. Find something that you want to spotlight and build it from the inside. Like talk about it as a staff. And, it, and this can be like faculty. Like So we don't have faculty meetings anymore. I don't call them faculty meetings. I, I call them faculty enhancement opportunities because they're an opportunity for us to learn and grow, not just for us to sit and hear me talk. Um, you can spend an entire year as a school thinking about what you believe. What do you believe in? What do we espouse in our actions? And, and what does this communicate when we say this or do that? And so I think you have to start there and then go, go from that point. And use Facebook or use Twitter or you know, get to the parents the way that is easiest for you to do. That's, you know, we use email, a lot of email. So. Uh, I have two questions that I ask at the end of each interview, and they sometimes take a very short answer, and sometimes this is a very long answer. So okay. to respect your time, I'll ask them right now, and then if you take a long time, then that's okay. But um, the uh, the first one is, um, what is something that somebody, you advice you would give somebody today to help them become a transformative principal like you? Okay. Um, wow. Okay. Okay, I would say three things. One is, it's not about you. It's about the community and what their needs are. So when we talk about transformational or transformative leaders, those are people who can get their finger on the pulse and realize what needs to change and why it needs to change. So don't just change things for change's sake because you think you're a change agent, because then it becomes about you and not the school community or, or the instructional practices or the kids or whatever. Um, and that's, I've seen people fall into that that trap. Um, so it's not about you. Um, the second thing is you must stay current. You must be informed. You must be read. You must know what instructional practices that are rooted in research that have shown to be effective are ones that you value and you want to see in your school. And you must get buy-in in those. It can't just be you standing at a meeting and saying, hey, you know what? I think small group instruction is what we need to do, and this is what we're going to do. No, but instead, share an article send a link out, get the people talking about it, and get people thinking about it. Because in order to be a, transformative, a transformative leader, you're transforming people's thinking, right? You have to be able to transform people's thinking. But the only way that's going to happen is if they trust you, is if they know that it's not, again, not just about you. Um, it's about the issue. It's about the need. It's about the gap. It's about whatever. And so I guess relationships are very much at the core of any transformative leadership or transformational leadership. Because um, that's the expectation, that we're going to get student achievement to increase. We're going to get test scores to go up. We're going to get teachers to do X, Y, and Z. And the community is going to do A, B, C. That's what transformational leadership is about. But the only way that happens is if relationships are rooted in trust. And people know that you're not doing things for you. You're doing things because they're in the best interest of our kids, of our community, or so on and so forth. Um, yes, that, that is so powerful. Before you do the last thing, um, yes. that is the thing that I've heard over and over and over from these transformative principles that I've interviewed. It's about relationships and trust. And once that's established, you can do pretty much anything. And, uh -huh. and I appreciate you reaffirming that again and again because that is so vital. And the only way people will trust you is if you're, you're, you're not only talking the talk, but you're walking the walk. And when I first got here, I was modeling independent reading conferences. I was modeling small group instruction because it's what I believed was effective. But I was totally open to, hey, tell me. Rip me apart. Tell me why this does not work. Because um, I don't know. What do I know? I only know from the experiences I have. And when you build that trust, the smartest person in the room is the room, right? Everyone in that collective space. And we have such expertise in our buildings, in our communities, that in order to be transformative or transformational or whatever the word, it takes this collective process, this 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 group effort. You're not going to do it alone. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and this is just me personally, um, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take yourself as the principal too seriously because you're not that big of a deal. You're replaceable in a moment. Um, but take the work that you do seriously. And I live I live for the space 
I live for these kids and for our staff and our community. And it's why I'm here on a Friday when I'm off this week. And it's why I come in on weekends. It's why I'm here until 5.30, 6 o'clock at night at the expense of other things in my life, but very much because this is a priority. So for any new leaders who might listen to this, it's not about you. Don't take yourself too seriously because when you start walking around like I'm the principal, you project this like sort of finished product. I'm finite. I'm done. I'm the principal, so I don't need to learn anymore because I did all this stuff. But you know what? If anything, you need to be learning the most and you need to be projecting the most and sharing the most. And again, it's not about you. It's about the relationships you build and it's about you not taking yourself too seriously. That's my opinion. I like to laugh and have a good time. So, oh, well, I think that's great advice also. Um, I, uh, I was talking to a teacher just a couple days ago and she said, I finally realized that I am a replaceable part in a big system and I can be out of the job tomorrow and mm -hmm. the work will still continue on and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's me doing it or if it's somebody else doing it. And, That's right. and so I need to do the best that I can, but I have to remember also that I'm not, I'm not the center of it. The kids are. And that's whatever it. I'm doing and needs to be focused on the kids. And that's it. You're, it's not about you. Like I don't show up here because um, I want people to like kiss the ring and you know um, bow to my feet. Uh, no, not at all. I come here because I want to set the stage for other people to shine and for other people to grow and for other people to learn. And my job as a leader is to remove the obstacles, not be the obstacle or not be the focus or whatever, you know? So that's really important to me as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, so the very last question is kind of a light softball question for you. What's something in your office that uh, you have there that inspires or motivates or reminds you why you're doing what you're doing? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, it's pretty easy for me, but this is what I look at every day. Uh huh. Um, this is my son. Um, and um, handsome boy. He's a, he's he's my life. Um, his name is Paul, and he is um, in fourth grade. He is why I do what I do because when I come when I come here, I always in the back of my head think. What would I want for Paul? What would I want Paul's school to be like? What would I want Paul's classroom to be like? What would I want Paul's community to be like? What would I want Paul's principal to be like? And that's where I lead. I lead from that space. And um, I think that's done me all right so far. Um, and I've learned more from him about education than anything I learned in a course, in a book, in a class. Um, because when you're a parent, I, I get it. I get it why parents come in here and they might be, you know, angry about something or they might be sad about something or they might be, this is your life this, this other person is like your heart and your soul right wrapped up in this other little body so I think of Paul and I think of the 403 kids that I have here they are someone else's life and heart and soul so I have the most important job in the world we as educators have the most important job in the world and I value that and so he is my motivation very much on a lot of levels yeah amen I my oldest daughter her name's Katya she's uh in second grade right now and uh, a great age. yeah same type of thing I I feel like so much of what I do is is dependent on on how I would want her to be treated and mm -hmm. and it gives me a great respect for the struggles that our our students and our parents are going through and and keeping her in mind helps me make yep. those those choices that are really beneficial for all my students not just one here or one there but for all of them yeah you know what Paul, Paul, our son was born with medical issues. His main issue is that he has um, congenital scoliosis, um, which requires surgery every six months. So you know it's quite a journey, right? Um, yeah. But what I've learned from Paul, he's so incredibly resilient and he's so incredibly positive um, that I realize anything that we can do, anything we want to do, we can do. We can make it work. Um, but everyone has a Paul in their life, <clears throat> so it may not be a medical issue. But our kids, our staff, our parents, they have a Paul in their life. You know, it might be someone who's learning disabled. It might be someone who's going through a divorce. It might be someone who's addicted to drugs. It might be someone who lost all their money because of the, you know, reg uh, re uh, recession. Sorry. Um, everyone has that person in their life, and we have to value that. We have to put value on that. And if we want our staff to be successful, we want our kids to be successful as a leader, I need to remember that because 
our staff is coming to school, and they may have had their kid throw up on them on the way to school, or they may have had their mom go to the hospital the night before, or one of our kids coming to school, and they may have heard their parents arguing the whole car ride to school or whatever. Those are things that shape shape us. For me, it's Paul that shapes you know my family, um, and so that's important to keep at the forefront when you're interacting with people, when you're placing expectations on people. They are these people who are shaped by their outside you know lives and experiences. So. That's, that's something important to me. Absolutely. Well, is, so, thank you so much, Tony, for your time. Is there any uh, final shout out you want to give or, or how people can connect with you? Uh, you can follow, find, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Tony Sinanis, T O N Y S I N A N I S. And my last name is a palindrome. So spell forwards and backwards the same way. So if you forget, just spell it backwards. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, you can go to our Jericho Schools uh, org is our website. You can find my school, Kaniac Elementary School, there. You can see my email address if you want. Um, we have units of study available online. You know, whatever people want to see. But Twitter is the best way to get me. Um, and all I can say is remember that being an educator means that you are constantly looking to learn and grow for the sake of children, right? And so if we can keep kids at the center, then we're good to go. That's right. Tony, again, thank right. you so much. This has been awesome. My pleasure, Jethro. Thanks. My pleasure. And I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. That really was an awesome interview with Tony. He is such an inspiring leader, and I hope that you learned a lot from him. I'd love to hear what you think about the show. Please feel free to send me some feedback, jethrojones at gmail.com, or you can find me on Twitter, follow me there, and give me some feedback as well, at jethrojones is my Twitter handle. Also, if you like this show, please share it with your friends on Twitter and Facebook and send them emails, let them know what's going on. Even if they're not into uh, social media, you can still share the great things that you're learning from these wonderful principles. Mm -hmm.